Hi guys, this is Rich with Wild Wonderful Weekends, and this is the final video in my series on Map and Compass Land Navigation. If uh, you've watched this series so far, you know how to use your topo map to identify common terrain features and how to calculate elevation, and you know how to use your compass to orient your map to the terrain, uh, account for magnetic declination, get a bearing to something in the environment, and also how to find your location on a map using resection. Uh, I'll link to those videos in the description so you can catch up if you haven't watched those yet. Uh, in this video, we're going to put all that stuff together so that we can learn how to move along a route. And when we start out, we'll start with a very short route just to show you the principles, and then we'll move on to a longer route so I can show you a more real-world application. We're going to cover a couple different techniques. Uh, one's called dead reckoning for moving in straight lines, and then we're also going to look at how to plan and move along in a regular route. That might be a little simpler to navigate. Um, you're going to use your compass to keep you on track and your pace count, but primarily it's going to be your map and terrain feature recognition that really help. So let's go ahead and get our map set up and get started. All right, I'm going to orient my map to the terrain. Uh, typically, you wouldn't want to do this on a picnic table because there is some metal hardware in these things that can interfere with the compass needle. But just to demonstrate how to do it, this will be fine. I already have my compass's magnetic declination set, which I covered in a previous video. And I'm going to move through this kind of quickly because I also covered how to orient your map to the terrain in a previous video, and I'll link to both of those in the description. Basically, what you do, though, is you set your compass bezel to north or zero. Then you move your compass's straight edge to a longitudinal line or the edge of the map. And then you rotate map and compass as a unit until the red part of the magnetic needle is in the orienting arrow, red in the shed. And once that's complete, your map is oriented to the terrain. And now we can start getting our bearings on the map. Okay, so for this demo, we are going to say that we've determined our location to be picnic shelter number four. And we want to get to this little blue building right here, which is the restrooms. So in order to do that, now that our map is oriented and everything, we're going to take our compass and we're going to connect those two locations. Now we want to be sure that our compass is pointing in the direction we're going to be traveling. So if I did it this way, that would be incorrect. I need to have my compass pointing from Picnic Shelter 4 towards the restrooms. And I'm going to lay my straight edge so that it, di that it bisects those two buildings in a line. And you want to be real careful here because the more precise your uh, measurements are, the more accurate you're going to be as you navigate. So that looks pretty good, especially for this short distance that I'm going to travel. Now I want to hold my base plate of my compass really steady, and I'm going to rotate the bezel until red is in the shed again. And that is putting my red end of my magnetic needle to the orienting arrow. Once that's done, then my bearing that I'm going to travel along is going to be right here under my indicator line. So it looks like my bearing here is going to be 196. So now let's shoot our azimuth and navigate on that line. So using a body hold, which I describe in the fourth video in this series, I'm going to look along this line that my compass indicator is pointing at and find an object that I'll be able to walk towards. In this case, it will be that leaning tree here. Okay, so now that I've sighted an object along my bearing, I don't have to look at my compass anymore. I can just move to that leaning tree that I sighted. And then when I get there, I'm going to move to the other side of it, look at my bearing again, and sight another object in that line and move to it. And I would keep doing that until I reach my destination. I'll go ahead and move out to that tree. So now, on the other side of the leaning tree, I'm going to use a body hold again with my compass. I'm going to make sure that red is in the shed. I'm not adjusting the bezel or anything like that. And I'm going to look along my line of travel again. I'm going to look along that bearing. And I'm going to pick out another object uh, within that line to walk towards. Now, again, this is an extremely short distance. This is just for example. I could just easily walk to the restrooms here. But the point is to show you that you can sight along this line, pick an object, and then navigate towards that object, and then repeat those steps until you get to where you need to be. Okay, so now that I moved to the second object that I sighted along my bearing, I would move to the other side of it and take another sighting along my bearing. But this time, you can see that I've actually made it to the restrooms. So a very small route, very short example, but it does demonstrate the principles of how you can get a bearing, sight something along that bearing, move to it, then get a new uh, sight something along the bearing, and just keep going and going and going until you reach your destination. Now that's called dead reckoning, and uh, there's some obvious drawbacks to it. If this had been any like real amount of distance, especially in West Virginia, you're going to encounter some terrain that you're not going to be able to just walk through, like ravines, cliffs, uh, you know, other obstacles and stuff like that. So there's a better way to navigate, and I'm going to show you that next. 
It's much better to carefully plan an easily navigable route on your map and then use terrain features and structures to stay on course, as well as your compass for directional checks and your pace count. I'll show you what I mean. My son has placed a marker in the park and marked its location on the map here. And I know my starting point is here. Uh, most times when you're starting navigation, you do know where you're starting from, but if you didn't, you could use resection if you could find some uh, distinguishable landmarks. I could get a bearing from my location to my destination and head out in a straight line, but that would prove very difficult, and in some terrain settings it would be impossible. So instead what we're going to do is look at the terrain and take advantage of features and existing routes to plan an easier route. The first thing to notice is that there is actually an existing trail for most of the way to my destination, so we'll definitely be taking advantage of this trail. But even so, it's always important to note terrain features and structures that will pass along the way, just to help keep us on course. This is all the more important in places that you're unfamiliar with, because there's always the possibility you have miscalculated your starting point. So if what you expect to see doesn't match what you actually see, you may have incorrectly assumed where your place is on the map. That's where handrails come in. Handrails are features and objects that run parallel to your route of travel. Roads, trails, rivers, train tracks, and power lines are all examples of handrails. Here we'll be using the trail and the creek as handrails. Notice that this little blue line representing a creek runs parallel to the trail. So by paying close attention to the features, we will know what we should expect to see as we travel, and if that ever doesn't match what we actually see, we need to reconsult our map and reconsider our location on it. Notice when we first start out, we'll be facing southward, and the creek will be on our right. The next thing to notice is that we'll cross the creek three times. Shortly after this, the trail should fork near a triangular shaped field. We can tell this is a field because there are no contour lines on this relatively large area of land. Taking the time to notice feature details like this will help you stay on course as you navigate. When we arrive at this fork in the trail at the triangular field, we'll want to follow the trail to the right and travel south along the west edge of the field. At the southern tip of the field, another trail will branch off from our trail to the left called Pine Ridge Trail. This will be an excellent landmark for us to confirm that we're indeed on the right course. We'll keep right on our trail, and notice at this point the creek should be on our right. But then we'll need to cross the creek twice more. After crossing the creek the second time, we'll be just to the right of the draw where our destination is. My son gave me instructions that after crossing the creek the second time to continue on the route 200 feet, then move along a bearing of 118 degrees to get to our destination. Since my pace distance is five and a half feet, I'll need to count 36 paces to cover 200 feet and before getting my bearing of 118 degrees. And that should get me to my hidden marker. So using the trail, creek, and other intersecting paths as handrails and checkpoints to confirm we're on target, and then using our pace count to travel 200 feet and a known bearing to point us toward our destination should get us where we want to be. Now, besides just using handrails, there's another navigational tool that we should always use, and that's a backstop. Backstops are easily recognized features or objects that if we encounter along our route, we know we've gone too far and overshot our destination. So an example of a backstop in this demo would be the Dunlop Trail here. In other words, if we're traveling along our route and then come across the intersection of Dunlop Trail, we know we've gone too far. A backstop can be any terrain feature or structure so long as it's easily identifiable and not easily missed. The last navigational tool you should use when planning a route is an emergency route. This will be a route you can take if you get lost that you know 100% will get you back to safety. So, as an example in the area that we're navigating today, should we become lost? If we simply travel northeast, we would encounter the main road that runs through the forest. Now that we've planned our route, paid close attention to the terrain, and made notes of landmarks and things we should encounter along the way, we've determined our handrails and our backstop and our emergency route, we're ready to begin moving. Okay, so I'm here. I've got my map and I've got my compass, but most important, I've got my route planned. And like I showed you on the screen, I know how many times I'm going to cross the creek, and I'm going to be paying attention to those landmarks as we go. So we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so when I started out, the creek was on my right, just like we planned, and I've crossed it for the first time now, and the creek is going to be on my left for a while. So we're getting up to the second creek crossing, and now the creek is moving from our left back to the right again. Now, I'm not really keeping up with my pace count right now. I'm not necessarily checking my uh, compass very often. I don't have any particular bearing I'm heading towards. I'm just paying attention to what I already saw when I planned the route. 
and making sure that it unfolds the way I expect it to and so far so good. Uh, I will be using my compass and my pace count at the very last leg of this thing though. We'll go ahead and go across. Okay, so we're coming up onto the third creek crossing now. And you can see it's moving from my left, I mean, sorry, from my right back over to the left again, which is exactly what we planned. But you can also see that it's actually splitting over there, just like we saw it would on the map. So, so far everything's checking out just fine. Uh, that means the next land feature that we really paid attention to when we were planning the route is going to be that triangular uh, field that we should be coming up on pretty soon. Okay, so we've come up on that triangular field that we saw on our map when we were making our plans. And uh, we've been traveling mainly south where we just kind of keep a little check on it with our compass. And we know now that we're going to turn right and uh, we're going to leave the field and continue on our trail. when we were planning this it looked like there was an uh, unpaved road here that we were going to be on and if you look down you can actually see that you can tell there used to be a road here there's some gravel and stuff like that but sometimes depending on how old your map is you have to really pay attention and really look for some of the terrain features that you might have found on the map when you're planning and that's why it's so important to make sure that you have an up-to-date map when you're doing this too because things can change especially new construction and stuff like that you know they can uh, change irrigation uh, the direction of creeks you know they can divert a creek or something like that so always try to get an up-to-date map case of work getting to the narrow part of the field here now and uh, just like we saw on our, on our map one of our kind of landmarks was the uh, Pine Ridge Trail and we see now that we're coming up pretty close to that so that's that keeps us right on course and lets us know that we're, we're moving along as we planned and we're going to keep right and we're going to stay by the creek and just like in our plan now we should cross the creek uh, two times So here's our first creek crossing, and it's moving from our right to our left, just like we had planned. A little washed out here, so we're going to be careful. at our second creek crossing now so what I'm going to do after we cross the creek is I am going to start keeping my pace count and uh, when I get to the end of my pacing area I'm going to get a bearing and then that's when we ought to be able to find our, our destination. <clears throat> okay so now that I crossed the creek for the second time I'm going to start keeping my pace count and on their plan we determined it to be probably a couple hundred feet up there at my pace of five and a half uh, feet per, per pace that's going to put me to about 36 uh, steps to get where I need to be to get my bearing to move into the draw. And the reason that I start paying attention more here to my pace count and to get a bearing when I get to the end of it is because there aren't as many uh, terrain features to go by now. And as you start running out of really distinct terrain features to kind of check your uh, navigation along, you do got to start kind of uh, paying more attention to pace count and, and bearing and stuff like that. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to start counting my pace.
that was 36 paces, so now I'm ready to get my bearing. Okay, so we determined in our plan that the bearing would be about 118, 120. I'm going to set it at 118. I'm going to do a body hold, put red in the shed. And I know I'm moving towards the draw too, so that's kind of my sanity check on that. You know, I've got my bearing that I'm going to get, and I know there's a big draw right here, and, I, and you'll see that as I start moving towards that area, that it is, the terrain definitely pulls away into a draw there. Even though the vegetation's kind of dense, you can tell that. So there we go. I'm going to sight a grapevine, and I'm going to start heading towards that, because I know it's not a long distance from here too, because of the map. Okay, and I can already see the cone uh, set up here, so we know we're on top of it. And again, this is kind of a very short distance demo, but it's just to illustrate the principle. But there's my, there's my destination there, the little cone. And so, um, again, what we did is we used our terrain features and the knowledge of our map that we got when we were planning our route. We used our pace count and a bearing at the end uh, to find our ultimate destination. We used uh, the terrain as handrails. Uh, we also set a backstop uh, that we'll go ahead and move towards that also, just to show you how that works. And we set our emergency route, which we, of course, didn't have to use. But we'll go ahead and get back on the trail and pretend that we missed this spot, we missed our pace count, and I'll show you the backstop. Okay, so we're back on the trail now. We're pretending like we missed our pace count, or for whatever reason, we didn't make that spot that we just uh, stopped and, and went up to our actual destination. And this is why it's important to have a backstop. Now, in this demo, the backstop's really, really close. Like I said, this is all very short distance, just to illustrate principle. But uh, you definitely don't want your backstop to be too far. And it can be anything. Like if you know you're in a low elevation area and all of a sudden you start moving up elevation, that, that could be a backstop for you because you know, hey, I shouldn't be going uphill right now. Um, but right over here is our backstop. And it's the, uh, the Dunlop Trail. So we knew if we went far enough along this route to intersect Dunlop Trail that we'd gone too far. And we could reconsult our map and it's, we know we're right at the entrance of Dunlop Trail, and we would see right away that we are also at the edge of the draw that goes up the hill here. So we want to pan over there and get that draw. So that draw goes all the way between these two hills. So thanks for watching, guys. That's it, and I hope you enjoyed this series. Don't forget, if you like these videos, please like and subscribe. I am going to talk to the folks here at Canal State Forest and see if they might let me hide something and then make a video with a few instructions on how you might be able to put some of this stuff to use and, uh, and find it. I'll, I'll keep you posted on the details on that. But thanks for watching and take care.